Welcome back, Spare Parts Army. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Russia has lost an estimated 292 BTR variants in the war so far. And after action report in the US military is customary to do after each mission, so you can look at what worked and what didn't work. In this episode, we're gonna do an after action report on the Russian armored BTR. How is it performed in combat compared to how it was originally meant to be used? What is the large scale ground offensive revealed about its true strengths and weaknesses? Is the BTR worse than we think or simply not being used correctly alongside light infantry? In order to understand its performance in Ukraine, we need to take a look at its development history first. In 1956, the Soviet Union decided to create two armored personnel carriers. One would be the more expensive tracked BMP-1 version and the other would be the cheaper wheeled BTR-60. At the time, it was revolutionary. No one else had a highly mobile 8x8 wheeled troop transport capable of carrying 12 soldiers. This concept would influence infantry fighting vehicles in the American military to this day with the Stryker. The BTR-60 looked like a caterpillar with teeth. Its only downside was this thing was a convertible with the top down. Great if you're in Southern California, not so great if you're in Southern Afghanistan getting shot at. So they quickly fixed this vulnerability in the BTR-70. The design choice of where to place the engine tells us a lot about the Soviet Union's priorities. Because they compromise quality of life so that the engine is easier to reach. This is great placement for manufacturing and for repairs. You get a cheaper vehicle that's easier to maintain, but you can't exit the vehicle from the rear. The new engine in the BTR-82 generates 300 horsepower and when it's well-maintained can reach a speed of 100 kilometers per hour on road with a max range of 600 kilometers or 370 miles. But the problem is a lot of the old BTRs only have 260 horsepower, which is barely enough to handle the giant 30 millimeter auto cannons, 400 pounds of additional weight. Military analyst Rob Lee knows that he believes in the final analysis in Ukraine might show that the BTR wasn't at fault, but that the mechanized infantry doctrine was overused by the Russians. War is a combination of equipment and fighting doctrine. The two should go together like a delicious PB&J sandwich. The groundbreaking tactics that the BTR was invented with no longer work in the modern era. Between the 1960s all the way to the end of the 1980s, the Soviet army motorized all of the rifle battalions from light infantry into all of the platoons having vehicles of some kind. This was a relatively new concept, and a relatively new BTR-70 was perfect fit for it. Cheap to mass produce, the BTR-80 goes for an average unit cost of under a million dollars, 663,000 bucks. But doing this mass transition to motorized units would eventually lead to a tactical problem that wouldn't become apparent until 2020. With the new auto-lock anti-tank missiles, the need for dismounted light infantry that fell out of fashion for decades has once again become vital. Rob Lee, the military analyst, points out that the Russian military doesn't need a new BTR replacement or better technology. He appears to suggest that the armored vehicles didn't fail Russia so much as the lack of light infantry to protect the BTR was the failure. If soldiers had advanced first and routed out all of the Ukrainian anti-tank javelin missile teams, they wouldn't have been sitting ducks in the BTR, and then the vehicle could have advanced later in the rear of the formation. They built over 5,000 of the BTRs, although only about 1,300 are estimated to be actually operational in the Russian army in any battalion tactical group today. There's a lot of corruption that goes on where these generals are incentivized to kind of inflate those numbers, so it might be less than that. The rest were sold as exports to foreign militaries, and about 3,600 are estimated to be sitting in a field somewhere in eastern Russia covered in moss and grass for spare parts and reserves. Over 40 different countries use the BTR, including Colombia, Hungary, Ukraine, North Korea, Pakistan. So are all of those countries using bad troop transports? I don't think it's as simple as all that. The BTR got its first taste of combat in the Soviet war in Afghanistan. And by all accounts, it actually performed well, given the incredibly difficult mission that it had. Track vehicles struggled in the mountainous terrain. They still do to this day. You don't send track vehicles to Afghanistan. There wasn't really much of a better choice than the BTR. There's one really bizarre tactic that I've seen infantry use with the BTR that seems to defeat the purpose of the whole vehicle. Hey, platoon sergeant, I'm new. Really stupid question, but shouldn't we be inside the armored vehicle, not on top? The majority of the Russian army's BTRs are the 80 variant, which aren't really designed to counter mines and IEDs, 30,000 pounds of metal and armor and barely any to protect the floor. This is why you see most Russian infantry riding on the top of vehicles instead of inside. Another reason is they might believe that their chances of surviving an anti-tank missile is greater on the outside of the vehicle than on the inside. There is some possible logic behind the thought that some of these munitions are designed to punch a tiny hole into the armor and shoot hot sparks and fragments into the hull all of the destructive power is focused on that small opening 
which is easier to just punch through than spreading the force out over a large area. What this means is that sitting on top of the BTR might actually be safer of a spot than inside, especially if you don't have an RPG cage around the vehicle. Most versions of the BTR have a 30 millimeter auto cannon that fires 120 rounds per minute, which fundamentally turns it into an infantry fighting vehicle instead of an APC. One of the major drawbacks to the BTR-80 is that the main weapon on the turret is not stabilized, so it can only be accurately fired while the vehicle is sitting still. In order to rotate the turret, it's done by the gunner manually, so it's slower. The BTR is meant to be amphibious, powered by hydro jets that claim to be able to swim at six miles per hour, 6.2 miles per hour, excuse me. Many American armored vehicles are not amphibious and choose instead to add heavier armor. In Europe, crossing rivers is seen as a major problem, but the dream of swimming armor across water appears to have been too lofty of a goal because all of the failed crossing attempts and sunk vehicles that we've seen recently. After I spoke to a soldier who was familiar with operating the BTR and the BMP in the Belarus army, it sounds like the odds of being able to rely on swimming this thing across the river is very low because it requires you take a full day of maintenance beforehand, probably tightening up all the gaskets and rubber ceilings. We've seen that many of the BTR vehicles are not able to conduct river crossing operations. The vehicle is designed to have a crew of three and carries seven infantry in the back in addition. The BTR is well known for its quirky design choices that seem strange to my American eyes. I was in a mechanized infantry unit, so the side dismount hatches actually at face value look like a great option. It makes it seem like there's more ways to get out of that hole. It also allows you to choose which side to dismount on, which seems good on paper. There are Russian BTR promotional videos putting a lot of emphasis on the fact that troops can dismount while the vehicle is moving, which in theory I can understand why they would think that that's a great thing, but in reality it's not necessarily the best idea. Once you have a seven-man squad in full battle rattle, weighing over 100 pounds, each with a full rucksack, all trying to dismount from a single door on either side of the vehicle, you'll realize that trying to dismount on the move is a terrible idea. There's an old saying in the army, train like you fight. If you train like you're in a promotional video, you're gonna fight like that too, but it's not safer. Evidence for this is every other country chooses to have their troop exit from the rear of the vehicle only. Part of the other reason for this is because that kind of compromises the integrity of the armor on the whole. Every time you add any kind of a hole on the armor, it's going to make the armor less strong. This video is a perfect example of what surprised us the most about the BTR's performance in the war in Ukraine. We see here two Russian T-72 tanks are making their way down a street in Mariupol. One Ukrainian BTR-4 is able to get around them in their flank, and now it has a perfect lined up shot on their weakest part of their armor. Usually the armor is only about 8 inches thick on the back of a tank. Armor piercing fin stabilized rounds from a 30 millimeter BTR-4 can penetrate over 8 inches, just over 8 inches of armor. So I think a lot of us were surprised by how effective the BTR was, especially in a defensive role against the T-72 heavy tanks. The BTR-82 was introduced in 1982, has improved night vision optics, navigation system called GLONASS. It can carry one additional soldier for a total of eight. Many of the older variants do not have these modern features, though we've seen them burnt out without any GPS features inside. There are two main theories held about these kind of wheeled armored infantry fighting vehicles. The first is that they should not have an autocannon turret on top because it encourages them to get into armor-on-armor armor battles that they were not designed for. The second theory is that they need a powerful lethal weapon with something that has more kick and more capability than a 50 caliber machine gun. Before this year, I have to admit, I leaned towards maybe no turret was the right idea. I thought maybe we should use them in a larger strategy that includes tanks and heavier tracked IFVs like the Bradley. But now after seeing how this kind of armor versus armor war plays out in real time, I think we've gotten some data that can help put this debate a little bit to rest. We've seen numerous instances where the BTR in Ukraine came into contact with a tracked T-72 or a BMP, and it was able to hold its own only because it had a 30 millimeter autocannon. It might make it slightly less effective as a troop transport, but I think any vehicle with a 50 cal or less is just dead in the water today. So while the BTR might have been largely responsible for starting this and spawning this whole trend of wheeled infantry fighting vehicles with an autocannon, and it might have been right about that direction that it went in, it still has a number of problems that have been holding it back. We'll see if it's more of a doctrinal issue or if it's an equipment issue as the war continues to play out. I'm curious to know what you guys think on the matter. 
Hey Spare Parts Army, if you guys like this video then I know you'll love this one on the Estonian military. It's a rundown on how the Russian army might be using hybrid warfare against their forces. So check it out if you get a chance, I know you're going to like it. 